Thank you very much and welcome everybody. I'd like to welcome everyone on behalf of INCLO, the International Network of Civil Liberties Organizations, and my organization, FATS, or ACLU, and also on behalf of the uh, event was co-organized by these three organizations. Uh, I would like to focus on the grainy ground uh, uh, manual that is only available online, but you can find this brochure on your table. Uh, the Gaining Ground Manual addresses the all too familiar phenomenon, uh, the shrinking civic space from a very practical point of view. So our aim was to... Uh, can you hear me like this actually? Okay. So our aim was uh, to collect uh, and uh, organize different threats that civil society organizations face around the globe and also provide practical answers to them. Collect all the good practices that are available uh, in a manual and provide that to civil society around the globe. So the global trend to shrink uh, the space for democratic dissent uh, is a phenomenon that we, we are very familiar with. It uh, encompasses uh, regulations to restrict foreign funding for NGOs, but also smear campaigns attacking the credibility uh, of uh, civil society organizations. It doesn't only affect civil society organizations in the registered and formal NGO form, but uh, uh, our assessment found that uh, it's very similar tactics are used against people who defend uh, um, in, in, the, in the countries where it's prevalent. According to the Civics Monitor, the Civics Monitor tracks the changes regarding civic space globally, regionally, and nationally. So according to the Civics Monitor in 2017, uh, 109 countries have uh, closed, repressed, or obstructed civic space. That means that 82% of the world's population live in a country where the civic space, the space for dissent, the space for active participation, is uh, somehow obstructed or even closed. So uh, this is the phenomenon that we address in, in this, in this uh, manual, and uh, we identified five types of threats. Uh, one is the new and restrictive reporting regulation, uh, we are familiar with this uh, from our 2017 anti-NGO law that requires organizations to uh, publish on their website and on, and, uh, on their publications that uh, they would be foreign funding. And the different tactics that we address uh, are organized under the name to comply or not to comply. There are different approaches to that. Whether you comply with the, uh, with the Excessive, uh, excessive uh, reporting regulations. The second trend is uh, the interference with NGOs and intimidation of staff. Uh, how, how do you respond to that? And one response uh, is uh, the enhancing the digital security of the organization or within the organization. Uh, and the third threat that we identified is arbitrary legal action and providing foreign funding. So in the manual, we discuss uh, forming alternative organizational structures that uh, allow organizations to mitigate this type of threats. Um, and these, the first three threats are more on, of, of uh, defensive nature. Uh, they are more inward looking. They are more focusing on how to protect yourself. By the, uh, by the uh, fourth and the fifth, uh, threat and the accompanying tactic is more forward-looking, is more looking uh, about how to solve the situation and reflect on our practices and also it uh, builds on the ability to learn from mistakes and understand the possible shortcomings of, uh, of the civic space or the civic sector. So the fourth threat uh, is called NGO sector by the salt. And the possible uh, uh, answer to it is uh, forming alliances. Um, one of the case studies is, uh, is from our Kenyan partner in Iklo. They managed to form a coalition uh, that not only joins 
organizations from the civic space, from the civic sector, but also faith-based organizations and organizations from the private sector. So the Kenyan Human Rights Commission uh, managed to bring together all these different type of uh, organizations and thematize um, the authority regime and uh, its, uh, its activities as state capture. Uh, they also say that the memory of a former repressive regime helped them in addressing uh, the situation and forming the, the alliance. So the memory of the former uh, repressive regime was helpful in bringing together all these different type of actors and, uh, and uh, develop the state capture narrative that helped them to uh, hold some of the proposed uh, regulations. And the fifth thread, and that brings us together, uh, brings us closer to the topic of today's event, is about delegitimization, delegitimized through claims of foreign funding and no local consequences. This basically touches on the legitimacy of the organizations and uh, the legitimacy that is coming from the symbolic power of, uh, of civil society, the power that, uh, that civil society organizations have are not an economic power, but it comes from our values, from our moral, from our mission that we are standing up for the vulnerable. Uh, and uh, this, uh, this threat threatens this very uh, legitimacy that is coming from that. So a possible answer is uh, reshaping public perception and building constituency. And uh, let me give uh, one of uh, our examples at ACLU uh, about the possible way to address this threat. Uh, in the wake of uh, 2017, when the very hard on ngo campaign started and the government uh, proposed to build on foreign funding uh, organizations, we started to develop a new campaign called the ACLU is needed. At, at the beginning, we really used this hashtag to communicate about our success stories, but it uh, quickly became uh, a comprehensive communication campaign in which we wanted to lay out our values, show who we are and what we believe in, and also the clients that are reporting about why they need the ACLU, why the ACLU is important for them. So this uh, also feeds into the discussion about uh, reinforcing the human rights narrative, uh, explaining the values that we have in a very easy to understand format. I really like the word relatable because Oftentimes, the human rights movement uses uh, abstract, legalistic language. And in this campaign, we attempted to use a much more plain language. We use a uh, language that doesn't refer to legal terms or terms that are not uh, easy to understand for, uh, for average people, like the rainbow families. Instead, we use the word or we use the expression families or children whose parents didn't marry. So, and, and that was really powerful on the one hand. And on the other hand, not only the other. So we showed um, an elderly lady who fought local corruption in, in her town, and we showed families who uh, suffered from poverty. And this reinforced our message uh, and allowed us to communicate that human rights and the, the values that we are standing uh, for are for everyone. Um, and we will continue uh, with this uh, discussion about communication in the second uh, panel. So I, I will stop here and I just wanted to give you an example from, from Hungary uh, to, to show that uh, there is also some thinking about this. Uh, and uh, finally, just few words about ego because I, I forgot. Uh, to talk about it, ECO is a network of 13 national independent civil liberties and human rights organizations from around the world working to promote fundamental rights and freedoms. The Justicia and ACLU are members, but also the Canyon organization that I mentioned. Uh, and we came together to bridge the, our local work with the international work, and one of the outcome is the manual. Uh, that, uh, that, that I discussed. Thank you very much.